Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward, and this is Face to Face. Our guest this week is Ontario NDP MPP for Kuwaitanong, Saul Mamakwa. Saul is a Kingfisher Lake Band member and a resident of Sioux Lookout. He is the opposition critic for Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation and acted as a health advisor for the Anishinaabe Aski Nation. Saul, it's a great pleasure to have you with us. Uh, thanks for being with us this week. Thanks for the invite there, Dennis. It's good to be here. Uh, let's just start with uh, what one long-time Ontario political observer referred to as, quote, the worst thing I've ever heard an Ontario Premier say. And that is when Premier Doug Ford accused you of jumping the queue to get a COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, you've been at Queen's Park nearly three years now. Did that accusation come as a shock to you? Uh, you know, when, uh, when he first said it, I actually shook my head. And, uh, you know, and I thought of how perhaps uh, he just didn't know between uh, off reserve and on reserve indigenous people. And then, but uh, the more I thought about it, then, uh, you know, just, uh, the comment just, you know, uh, showed a lack of compassion, lack of uh, respect, and also the, the indifference that, uh, um, that really, uh, uh, exhibited uh, under there but also like i think uh but the more i reflected you know when you know when we talk about uh, uh uh colonialism oppression and the racism that exists within uh within that comment that kind of like came, came to the conclusion of that 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 evening the day of the, the day it happened yeah you did call the uh incident uh, or an incident of racist oppression and colonial strong-arming. Can you uh, talk about why you felt that way? You know, uh, you know, uh, his uh, stereotypes about me as a First Nations MPP, you know, in this day and age and uh, to, for that type of, uh, that's what colonialism looks like in 2021. When uh, his stereotypes about me as a First Nations person, that's what it looks like as a, you know, uh, racism looks like in 2021. And, uh, to try to put me in a place, like a, one of the comments that he made is that that, that I don't belong in that community, and that it's really uh, evident that you know he's trying to control uh, where I should be, control where as a First Nations person where I should be, where I belong, and for him to uh, to undermine even undermine the, the work of the that we're trying to do with the um, with the vaccine rollout, and that's what oppression looks like, oppression. Colonialism is racism. And I think, uh, you know, for me, um, as a First Nations person, you have to understand that. And that's like how, how I grew up with it. You live with it. You normalize it. And and I think uh, the way it was said, I wasn't able to react it because, you know, to me, it's, uh, it's the water that off duck's back. And I think, uh, you know, people coming out and on saying, uh, remind me on how you know, uh, uh, racist that was. It, it just gave me, you know, like, a, you know, a certain, uh, you know, vision, a certain thing to understand, like, what it really meant. And, uh, and I think that's what it, that's what it really, uh, that's what I began to understand, the, the holding of the, the racist stereotypes that exist. And even at the highest, highest level, political level in Ontario, for him to say that, you know, just imagine what happens in the bureaucracy. Just imagine uh, what happens in uh, the systems that we have to go through as First Nations, Indigenous people across uh, across um, Ontario, across Canada. I understand the the premier did make a uh, a ninety second call to you or so uh, to apologize. Did that go far enough? You know, um, you know, yes, uh, we did have a conversation uh, Friday afternoon, and uh, we had that quick call. And uh, basically, he told me that, uh, you know, uh, called me personally to apologize for, you know, going after me in question period, like attacking me personally. He apologized for that, and 
certainly I uh, responded by saying, you know what, that I really appreciated his call. I appreciated that he actually took the time personally to, uh, you know, uh, to call me. And um, that's the discussion that we had. And um, I know as an op official opposition, we pressure the government on the, some of the actions that they take. And, uh, and I think uh, he felt pressure from me regarding that. And, uh, and started attacking me, but we spoke about that, and we spoke about perhaps um, me sitting down with him at some point and uh, at his office and to talk about this. And I think uh, to this day, uh, uh, you know, I was asking about the, the role of, of uh, you know, uh, urban indigenous uh, vaccinations in uh, in Ontario. So that's what I was asking about. So, but that's, and I think uh, you know, uh, a lot of people are asking me if uh, you know, like. Uh, he should apologize uh, in, a, in, a, in a place where it happened, which is in the chamber, in the Ontario legislature. And I, I know, um, you know, but I can't force him to apologize if he, like, I think we already, you know, he, I already know what, how he feels mm -hmm. or, uh, you know, like, and what, what, what good will it do? And uh, I already know uh, uh, the, uh, where it's, um, where it lies, because like, for example, uh, you know, Dennis, I, uh, if a First Nation, if the community leadership, uh, you know, like say, uh, uh, wants, pressures the government and asking for clean drinking water, a water sewer system that is, you know, fully functional. And if we ask for clean drinking water and if they pressure the government the way I pressure them, that's the same treatment that they would get. And I think that's, uh, you know, even somebody trying to access healthcare services or whether it's, uh, uh, you know, that they're uh, entitled to and pressuring the, the system that's there, whether it's healthcare, whether it's education, that's the same treatment that they would get. And I think that's, uh, you know, for it to happen at a very, um, you know, political level in Ontario, at that, that political high level, that's the same treatment that people will get. And I think that's one of the things that we need to be able to discuss is, uh, you know, the, the stereotypes that exist with, within there. And, and, and it's it was so wrong for him to kind of... Uh, say those things on and it's so wrong uh, you know uh, even like me jumping the line does that mean i'm i'm cheating the system that's their access to healthcare access to the vaccine where i'm trying to promote the uptake of the vaccine in first nation communities and the flying communities and you know it's a, it's it's like uh, you know that uh, it's like you know you know first nations indigenous people are are cheating the system it's not. It's not going to be. He's not going to be the first one to say that. He's definitely not be the last one to say that. And it doesn't make it right either. It does not make it true either. So those are the issues that uh, we need to be able to talk about. And I think. Uh, and one of the things I made clear, um, you know, in my in uh, when I was talking about, it, I will not let the premier or the health minister separate me from you know, the communities I represent. Mm -hmm. And there's just communities. I am not going to let them separate me from the, the communities I represent and because I am first, foremost, First Nations person, period. And that's, that, and that's what I mean by, that's what colonialism does. That's what oppression does. And that's racism. And that we have to put them account to that. So we know there is that hesitancy out there among First Nations to get the vaccine, and so it was important for you to show yourself getting it. Uh, as we mentioned off the top, you were a health advisor to Anishinaabe Aski Nation, which represents 49 First Nations in Northern Ontario. How has the, the pandemic affected uh, the people of your riding? It's exposed some of the uh, inequalities, uh, the inequities that exist within the system, whether it's education, whether it's uh, uh, policing, whether it's uh, housing, with access to health care, there's uh, certainly a lot of um, needless deaths, mm -hmm. unnecessary that is happening in our communities. And we have to, you know, and for example, is, um, you know, housing as well, uh, the overcrowding. And I know I visited one of the communities in Yab, uh, community of Yabatug, and there were, you know, um, communities, uh, individuals actually, individ community members that were living in tents and minus 45 below and that's not acceptable anymore and that's what i mean we need to be able to bring these issues and COVID 19 has really really exposed those issues at uh, uh, the inequalities 
So much more to talk about here. We just got to step aside for a quick break and then we'll continue the conversation here on Face to Face with Saul Mamakwa. Welcome back to Face to Face. Our guest this week is Ontario NDP MPP Saul Mamakwa and we were talking about uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and its effect in the last block there and so uh, Thunder Bay, which is, uh, you know, the services hub for many First Nations, is experiencing an awful uptick in COVID cases. Some of it has been blamed on the district jail, which I'd like to talk a bit about. Uh, how would you describe the jail in Thunder Bay? I know uh, I visited uh, the jail a few times uh, since my term uh, as an MPP, and I know um, it's a uh, it's not a good place. It's not a very it's a very overcrowded place. It's not safe for uh, 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 the inmates that are there. But not only that, but not safe for the uh, the workers that uh, uh, the correctional workers that there that are there. So it's uh, and I think uh, uh, the plan on uh, when uh, the the case uh, started the cases the COVID cases started in uh, in there and I don't think there was a proper planning, a proper uh, process in place to whereby sometimes, you know, people were sent, uh, went back to their communities and it just spread like that. And it's just, uh, there was just a, a lack of planning on lack of resources for the, the correctional center to be able to address those. And uh, there was no uh, coordination, uh, lack of coordination or minimal coordination for that matter. And you know, to be able to address that. And, and it's another thing too, is um, the, uh, the homeless uh, or, uh, people without homes were having to have positive cases and it's just uh, uh, having a detrimental impact on uh, the North and, and the people that are in the uh, indigenous people that are in the, those settings. So it's a really uh, concerning, especially, uh, you know, with the, the numbers of, uh, you know, like today, uh, you know, like today is, uh, is a hot spot. Uh, for uh, COVID-19 and uh, Thunder Bay and Toronto or in Ontario are the hot spots uh, right now as we speak. Nine people have died at that prison since 2002. Seven of them were Indigenous, including uh, your, your nephew, Kevin Mamakwa. You know, a new district jail is expected to be constructed soon-ish. Is, is that going to solve some of the problems here? I think, uh, you know, like uh, I, uh, if it's a new jail, like yes, uh, like that will solve the issue. But I think that because it's just a, uh, that place is just over continuously overcrowded. And uh, this thing was built in the 1930s and uh, it's just outgrow outgrown itself. And uh, the, uh, what the last time I went there, when you talk about a small uh, uh, cells and, you know, with two bunk beds and then there's were six people staying there whereby, you know, like on the floor, on that bunk bed, of each bunk bed, there were two people sleeping there. So that's an overcrowding. And I think uh, we need a, uh, and talk to some of the, uh, the indigenous people that have worked in the correctional system for a long time. You know, uh, they were telling me 60 to 80 percent of the people there are, don't belong in that jail. They need some type, you know, uh, they need some type of, uh, you know, uh, uh, a program, Indigenous-led program that will focus on wellness and uh, the, the systems that are there because of the lack of uh, support, uh, whether it's uh, mental health and uh, support system that are in place, is uh, uh, they they just it, it leads them to there, and we cannot continue to have that. And I think uh, we need to start looking at uh, transforming the, the justice system for Indigenous people, like uh, on the way we we do things that we used to do things. And uh, so, and I think that's the work. And then I, uh, again, like it's, we have to balance that and, uh, you know, like uh, a, a jail that will fit 300, 400 people. That's not the answer, but mm -hmm. still like we need to be able to have a, but it's all tied into the, uh, the chronic underfunding of the, you know, uh, you know, the legal aid Ontario, the policing service, uh, the court system, it's all interconnected with all that, you know, it, it's it's the justice system or should I call it the injustice system that exists in that. And we have to understand, you know, these this is not our system. This, we never created that system as Indigenous people. Like, 
that system is not broken. It's working exactly the way it's designed to, which is to take away the rights of our people to the lands and resources that are out here in Ontario, across Ontario. And, uh, and that's why we need to uh, start looking at taking back the, uh, taking back the, uh, uh, you know, the, the responsibility, the accountability, the resource allocation and handling our own uh, systems. And, uh, and then we have to take that back because uh, it's not broken, it's working exactly the way it's designed to. As we hear so often. Uh, Saul, as we mentioned, you know, you've been uh, MPP for nearly three years now. The first person to represent your riding, which was created in 2017, it's a massive riding. Uh, you know, why did you decide to, uh, to run in that, run for office? I think one of the things I, uh, as, as, as we mentioned, I did uh, work in health for a number of years. I got to understand the provincial side of uh, the healthcare system and um, and also the federal side. And one of the things that became very clear is how, again, a lot of people told me about how broken it was, and I, I started framing it in a different way, uh, whereby it's not broken. And uh, but I think um, when I uh, thought about it and. Uh, when uh, that time came to me in early 2018, uh, I had to, I couldn't uh, address the issues in health. There's only so much you can do in health, right? Uh, but I think it was important that we address uh, things holistically when we start talking about social determinants of health. Uh, you know, when access to education, economic development, uh, education, child welfare, these are the issues uh, that we need to be able to deal with. and. And I think uh, that has an impact on the health. And so I think to bring those to light, uh, to bring those to uh, uh, sharing those truth telling stories that happen in the, in the Indigenous communities, we, as a provincial member, I, I thought there was an opportunity to, uh, again, tell those truth telling stories to, you know, the rest of Ontario, the rest of Canada, and, you know, on what's happening and give uh, Indigenous people a voice. What's been the most eye-opening thing about provincial politics in Ontario for you so far? I think uh, the challenging part for me is like uh, because I have I represent 31 First Nations and 24 flying communities and uh, how you know uh, challenging it, it can be that uh, uh, when we talk about like say for example Niskandaga as an example is uh, they just want clean drinking water. Mm -hmm. And to play the jurisdictional ping pong on the health and the lives of the people of Niskanaga and the youth, and I, I, I cannot comprehend that on why both levels of government just step up and just fix these issues. And like, like today, I have, I think, 13 boil water, long-term boil water advisories in Kiwetnung riding, and, and that's not acceptable. And like uh, water should be just as you know, as basic a uh, basic human right, and people continue to play that game, and and, and I think, uh, and I think uh, it really opened up my eyes as well uh, that, you know, uh, uh, colonialism, oppression, racism, exist, in, uh in that place, and I think that's really uh, opened up my eyes, and uh, you know, like it's, but, yeah, like I, I I don't expect to change things, you know, night. 90 degrees or 180 degrees, but if I can change the trajectory of the thinking of the people that are there, whether it's 5%, 3%, you know, 7%, I would have done my part, but it's just, uh, you know, like uh, people just need to have the will to make the change, and it's, it's sometimes it's just hard to kind of try to convince people to change those, and it's, it's the lack of political will, mm -hmm. you know, putting resources in, that's all that matters, and, you know, we need to be able to stand together as Indigenous people across uh, Turo Island, across uh, Ontario, across Canada, to be able to make these changes. And uh, we need to uh, assert uh, our uh, rights as land rights holders, as treaty rights holders. And you know, we've got to come together. And, uh, and I think that's where they, uh, that's where as Indigenous people, we need to be able to rise, rise to that. And as we know, uh, Nishkantika every day inching closer to almost 10,000 days without uh, clean drinking water. Uh, so uh, we've got to step aside for one more quick break and then we'll continue the conversation here on Face to Face.
Welcome back to you Face to Face. Our guest this week is Ontario NDP MPP Saul Mamakwa. And uh, Saul, you know, we were talking about uh, your, your three years so far uh, as an MPP. And by all accounts, you're, you are one of the most respected uh, in Queen's Park. It, it's already been announced that you're going to run again in, in 2022. Are there things that uh, if you were elected that you're hoping to change at Queen's Park or, or in your riding? I think, uh, you know, the only way we can make change, uh, you know, um, is to form government. And I think that's important. And I know that um, uh, with the stories, uh, the truth-telling stories we've been doing, like uh, we've never, as Northern Ontario, uh, as Indigenous people, uh, we've never had that voice. Even in uh, Sulikot, uh, Red Lake, Pickle Lake, you know, within the writing itself, like we've never really had that focused voice here. And I think it's really important that, you know, like as, you know, non-Indigenous people, non-Indigenous communities, uh, even uh, Indigenous communities across the North, we need to work together. And I think that's one of the things I really uh, uh, recognize about uh, even uh, in Northern Ontario, for that matter, like whether it's Thunder Bay, Kenora, Dryden, uh, Timmins, we need to work together to address the, whatever services that we need with the example it's mental health, whether it's health services, we need to bring services closer to home. And I think um, as regions, as the Northern, Northern Ontario, we need to be able to work together no matter if we're Indigenous or non-Indigenous. And I think that's that's very clear. And, and that's the only way we can make changes to form government. And uh, and that's our goal as a, as a party is to form government in uh, June 2022. Uh, so you know, we've spoken about many things in the house. One of those things, uh, and again, we're we're short on time here, but I did want to mention that you know, you uh, the Ford government brought in standing and, and singing, "God Save the Queen" and, and uh, "Oh Canada," something that you've not taken part in. In our uh, brief few minutes here or seconds, can you tell us a bit about why you've taken that stand? Uh, they. They continued to uh, uh, back in uh, back in spring, uh, summer last summer, summer 2020, and uh, you know, uh, government uh, had continued to delay, com be complacent on access to clean drinking water, uh, uh, investing in resources on reserve, and uh, and it really, really uh, uh, kind of put me in a place where I I couldn't understand why when communities children and this is children want access to clean drinking water and that just floored me and uh, and i think um, you know for me to stand up at all canada uh, you know like it's i'm ashamed to be part of ontario i'm ashamed to be part of canada because of the way they treat indigenous people and there's no way i could stand up for that and there's no way i could and then and i started doing that in september 2020 and uh, the first day the first monday of each month and uh, that's what i do and you know Next coming up, I'll I'll sit down again, and but that but they don't respect the indigenous people. They don't respect the treaties that they signed, and because without the treaties, what is Ontario? What is Canada? So unfortunately, uh, we're all out of time this week, but uh, we do thank you for joining us. Good to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, you can catch up on any episodes you may have missed by visiting our website, aptnnews.ca. I'm Dennis Ward. Thanks for tuning in to Face to Face. Have a great night. We'll see you back here next week.